in now. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Lord. Holy Spirit, Lord, I thank you for being there within us, talking to us every moment. Every time you direct us, you tell us what is the truth, the truth as is going to be preached again today by our brother Vincent. Let this truth be abiding in us. Let that word never depart from us. Let it be continuously in our lips, in our mind, in our soul. Thank you, Jesus, that you set us free. There's no condemnation in us, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. We are free forever from condemnation. We have the mind of Christ and wisdom of God is formed within us, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Since I'm in Christ, the veil over my eyes have been removed, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I have been, we are made righteous, Lord Jesus, by you, your sacrifice on the Calvary and the cross and made, and given us a relationship with our Father. And I thank you, our Father, for giving us a most beloved Son. And thank you, Jesus, once again, for giving us the Holy Spirit. Now this Holy Spirit will be teaching us today and opening up our spiritual eyes, helping us to focus on your word and let that word never depart from us. We make this prayer in the holy and mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Sister Marcella, for that beautiful spiritual opening prayer. And my brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to each one of you. Today, our gospel reflection is from the daily gospel from Mark chapter 8, verses 13 to uh, 11 to 13. Mark chapter 8, verses 11 to 13. And you know, my brothers and sisters, before we go to today's reflection, you know, on Saturday, when we were reflecting the gospel of Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 10, we saw there that Jesus was teaching the people in a particular place. And after teaching them for three full days, without any food, without any water, without any comfort, he had fed that crowd with seven loaves and a few fish. He had performed a miracle. He had performed a multiplication of those loaves he had and a few fish. And he had fed of, uh, about 4,000 people, which never included the women and children. And today, we see that at the end of uh, uh, verse number uh, 10, I believe, Jesus left that place where he performed the miracle and he went into the place called Dalmanuta or Mandala. That's what we saw in the last verse, verse number 10. Now, sisters and brothers, what we are going to see is a continuation of Jesus' ministry. So after performing the miracle in a place on this side across the river, he takes the boat and he comes across to this place called Dalmanuta or Magdala. So let's pick up the gospel today from Mark chapter 8, verses 11 to 13. Let's read these three verses. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him. Amen. Seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, that there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship, again departed to the other side. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Now, you know, my brothers and sisters, as I said to you at the introduction, Jesus has gone into a place called Dalmanuta or Magdala. And when he gets into this place at Magdala or Dalmanuta, as we call it, he is greeted, or I would say he's not greeted. He is, uh, you know, the, the ones who meet him there are the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Now, you know, we have been studying in this last few weeks about Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter, in the Gospel of Mark, right from Mark chapter 1, we are now up to chapter 8. And we have been going on a journey with Jesus where he has been preaching the Gospel, he's been teaching the people, he even went into pagan territory, 
He also performed all those signs and wonders. And now, after performing his latest miracle of feeding 4,000 men, of course, not including the women and children, he's gone across onto the other side. But instead of meeting people, instead of the crowds receiving him, he's met by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, you know, my sister and brothers, I said to you before, in Jesus' congregation, there were different types of people. Actually, there were three categories of people. First was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the, you know, the religious leaders, the lawyers. Then you had those second category of people who were the disciples. And then, of course, were the crowds. The crowds. So there were three different categories of people. And on this occasion, as Jesus gets into the gets off the boat after performing this miracle, Jesus is met by the religious leaders. He's met by these religious hypocrites. And remember, the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers, they never came to Jesus in order to listen to him. They did not come to Jesus in order to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. They never came in order to understand the spiritual truths. They came to find some fault with Jesus. You know, my brothers and sisters, please understand this. It is very important for us to remember that when Jesus was preaching during his days, he's the son of God. He's God almighty in the flesh. He's got three different congregations. And the most difficult part, difficult people or group in that congregation were the religious leaders. They were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the lawyers, the scribes, the religious leaders who really were after Jesus. And you know, my sister and brother, as I already mentioned to you, these people did not come to believe in Jesus. These people did not come, you know, to learn anything. They came and asked Jesus for a sign from heaven. Look at what verse number 11 says. And, and the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. So that means when they came to ask Jesus for a sign from heaven, it was not a genuine request. It was not a genuine request. Remember my brothers and sisters, there are different types of questions to be asked. You know, when we ask questions, there are two types of people who ask questions. One type of people ask questions because they want to get a better understanding. They want the clarification. They want to know better. And those are the disciples who want to know more about the kingdom. They want to have an understanding so that with that understanding, they can now begin to practice that word. They can begin to, you know, start applying that word in their lives and begin to live the victorious life that, you know, the word promises them. But there are also the Pharisees, the Pharisaical attitude, as they call it, the hypocrites. When they ask questions, they are not coming to ask questions because they want to know something. Now, you know, my sister, let me give you an example, like the question that I was asked one time, which for which I myself did not have an answer. We all know that God created Adam, and then after some time, he created Eve. Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden, and then when they were banished from the Garden of Eden, they also had two sons. They had Cain and Abel. Now, if they had two sons, then how did the human race grow? Because nothing is mentioned about any girl. There's nothing is mentioned. So how would the whole human race go? Because there was only one woman that was Eve. And then somebody goes and asks you, how did the human race multiply? Adam and Eve were the parents. Cain and Abel were the two sons. Then how did they get children? Did, did Adam and Eve have more children? Now, you know, my sister and brothers, such questions even if I give you the answer, even if the Lord gives us an answer, and we know today this answer is not going to help us in any way because we are almost now thousands of years where the whole human race has multiplied. Thus we know by faith that it came from Adam and Eve. So how the how the woman came? How did the 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 the, the kingdom multiply? How did the world multiply? Is a question that sometimes we don't have an answer. 
and we cannot assume it that probably you know there was a relationship between the sons and the mother or the mother was just like a factory she just produced children and then those children they got married among each other we cannot start making any assumptions because we don't have the answer but we know that from one man and one woman the whole human race came so brahm says that there are many times people will ask questions not because they want to believe not because they have seen the miracle but they want to ask an irrelevant question for which there is no answer which is which is written in the word of god and assuming an answer and trying to give an answer simply does not make any sense and therefore when such questions are asked you know what i do i simply say i don't know i simply say i don't know because i don't know the answer and neither do i want to know the answer because i know that 2000 years ago jesus came to the cross he died for our sins he paid it all for us and today if i believe in him and i believe his word i know i receive the holy spirit and therefore through this new life with the holy spirit i can live a victorious life and i can share the good news to others that this life that i'm living is for real it's not some theory it's not some you know some some hyperbole or it is not something that you know which is an assumption it is a reality when i believe in jesus and receive the holy spirit so brothers and sisters it is important for us to remember when we ask a question the question when we asking is only with the intention of trying to grow to understand and not in the purpose of trying to find some fault and trying to find an answer which will even if i get the answer will simply not bless me or help me to grow in my faith so these pharisees these religious leaders they did not believe in jesus they had no faith in jesus they they saw the miracles they saw the signs and wonders they were they had seen people raised from the dead they had seen the multiplication they had even seen you know when they had come to a house where the where the where the house was full of people they raised, they lowered a, a, a paralytic into that house and jesus had told that paralytic your sins are forgiven you and because they had some doubt on that jesus simply told the paralytic pick up your mat and walk and right in front of their eyes they had seen a man who could not come inside who could not walk in his own walk out of that room before their very eyes but you know my sisters and brothers on this particular occasion these pharisees these scribes they came to jesus and asked him for a sign because they didn't believe that he could do anything they did not believe that he could do anything although they had seen the miracle they had seen signs and wonders and most of them brothers these pharisees and sadducees didn't believe in jesus because they did not want to believe in jesus and you know what happens jesus did not accommodate them jesus did not accommodate their unbelief and he also won't accommodate our unbelief either he won't accommodate unbelief you know what my sisters what is the meaning of unbelief unbelief is simply one side i have the word of god one side i have my five senses so when i see something i hear something i feel something i smell something because i've got my five senses and a person who's always operating according to their five senses but failing to operate according to the sixth sense which is god's word is a person who is operating in unbelief and we have already seen previously in this class there can be a person who could be having enough faith but at the same time operating according to their five senses and when a person is operating according to their five senses what the bible says is a carnal person his faith and his unbelief simply uh, you know negate each other and there is no result because i need the faith of a mustard seed and i need zero unbelief in order to see my miracle in order to see the best of god in my life it's something like this my friends sister you know imagine i don't know whether you have ever played uh, you know taken part in tug of war and if if in tug of war you have both the teams who are equally strong you know they actually pick up people on on the left and on the right having the same weight say the each person on the on this have got a total weight of say 100 kilos then everyone put together is also 100 kilos on this side when the tug of war is done when they pull none of the teams are able to pull and there is so much of tension on the center 
but there is no movement of the rope until one person let goes and then the other team can win in the same way it is with faith and with unbelief our faith can be negated by unbelief so these pharisees these religious leaders were only operating in unbelief that means they were so carnal they only operated according to their five senses and today my brothers and sisters through the new birth remember we all have been given the same faith of jesus christ let me show you where we have been given the same faith of jesus christ roman chapter 12 verse number 3 remember if you want to operate in according to the faith the same faith of jesus christ has been given to every believer it doesn't matter whether you are a new believer or you have been believing the gospel for the last 50 years of your life the moment you accept christ you have been given the measure of faith let us read that for i say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly according as god has dealt to every man the measure of faith and i want to highlight the measure of faith you know my sister brothers god has not given us a measure of faith remember the word a and the when it talks about the it is an article it is specific every person who has accepted christ every person who believed the gospel everyone who heard the gospel of jesus christ and accepted jesus as their lord has been given the measure of faith that means the faith of jesus the raising to life from the dead power which was in jesus has been given to every believer and that's why in the new covenant right today we have the holy spirit inside of us and it is the degree by which i renew this mind i'm able to let the holy spirit work in me through that abiding word which is already inside of me remember the word is already in my spirit because jesus is already there to the new birth but if i don't feed my spirit with the word of god i'm simply you know wasting my time you know looking at the television reading the newspaper going and watching youtube videos getting myself involved with all useless discussions but i'm not spending time with the word of god obviously my mind will not be renewed with the word of god i'll be so carnal based on what somebody said to me what the weather is like what the newspaper said what the television said and i will never be able to renew this mind and draw out from my spirit and live a victorious life live a life of faith so these pharisees my brothers and sisters these religious leaders they were operating in unbelief and jesus did not accommodate them and today he will not accommodate you and me why because god operates with us or god communicates with us only in spirit and in truth let me show you that Jesus was having an encounter with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 and i want to show you in John chapter 4 in verses 23 and 24 what Jesus was prophesying would happen and is happening right now through the holy spirit let's read verses 23 and 24 but the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeks such to worship him god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth those who worship god must worship him in spirit and in truth so brothers and sisters when you know that you know as we saw in roman chapter 12 verse number 3 we have been given the measure of faith the faith has already been transferred has been deposited in our born again spirit and therefore if we have to communicate with god god is not communicating with us in our mind god is not communicating with us in our body he is not communicating us in our in our thinking he is communicating with us in the spirit and therefore the holy spirit in me 
is going to help me to renew this mind with the word of God so that this mind of mine can now come into agreement which is in my born again spirit and I can live the victorious life. That's the time I'm going to see miracles. That's the time I'm going to see signs and wonders. That's the time through faith I will be able to appropriate everything that God has done. And dear brothers and sisters, asking for a sign, listen to this very carefully, asking for a sign is unbelief or tempting God. Whenever a person says, Lord, please give me a sign. Let the, you know, this flower petal fall down or let a mango tree fall down or let a mango on the, from the tree just fall on the ground. Oh Lord, just bring somebody into my life and show me that it is you, Lord. This particular thing is basically unbelief. You know, you cannot ask God today, God, give me a sign. He has given us his word. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we know which covenant we belong, there are many people today, they say, God, please give me a sign. Give me an indication. Lord, I want to see the rainbow up in the sky. I want to see some, you know, the clouds become into one man. I want it to look, look like a baby. I want it to look like some tree. And then, Lord, when I know that it is like that, now I know for sure that you are talking to me. Now I know that you have given me a sign. You know, sisters and brothers, to put such conditions on the Lord is nothing but tempting the Lord or operating in unbelief. Let me show you a scripture, what Jesus says in Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter four, I believe. Matthew chapter four, verses uh, five to seven. Can we go to Matthew chapter four? Then we will know exactly the scripture. Matthew chapter four, let's go verses six or seven, I believe it is. Let's go there. <clears throat> Asking for a sign in the new covenant, my brothers and sisters, is tempting God. You cannot tempt God in the new. We must remember we have the Holy Spirit who's speaking to us. Let's read this. Verses four, 6 to 7. And said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up. Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Imagine the devil is telling Jesus. He's quoting, the devil is also smart. He's quoting to Jesus Psalm 91. He's telling Jesus, Oh Jesus, just throw yourself off. You know, the angels will come for protecting you. They will not let you dash your foot against the stone. <laughs> Why should Jesus jump down and put the Lord to the test? Why should he put, but should Jesus be on the mountain and somebody throws him off? Surely the angels will come because they do not want Jesus to be physically hurt. But if Jesus is going to tempt the Lord and say, you know, Lord, I'm going to jump down. You're going to send your angels. Jesus himself, the son of God, is telling the devil, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. You know, my sister, the word of God also tells us that, uh, you know, I think it is, it is mentioned in, in, in Mark chapter 16. Well, let's go to verses 16, uh, 17 to 18. It mentions that, you know, believers shall drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm them. Let us read that. Let us read verse number 18. That particular verse. And if they drink any deadly thing. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. What is this verse saying? I wanted to highlight that. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Now, somebody can take this verse and you not know, say, I'm a believer. Somebody challenges them and says, you know, you know what? Going, we want to see really if you are a believer. They go to the, uh, to, the, to the pharmacy or go to some shop somewhere. They bring some deadly, you know, uh, rodent poison. And they say, please drink this. We want to see if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. You know, my sister and brothers, the moment you take that challenge and you say, I'm going to take it and my God is going to protect me. Do you know that when you drink that deadly thing, it will definitely kill you? Now, somebody will say, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. The point why it is going to hurt you is you are trying to test the Lord. At such occasions, when a person puts that challenge to you, you simply tell him, I don't need to tempt the Lord. I don't need to drink that deadly poison in order to prove to you anything. I don't need to prove it. But should anyone put a deadly poison without me knowing, I know my God 
is already going to protect me. That deadly poison is not going to harm me. So that's why when anyone came to Jesus and told him, you need to show us a sign. You need to prove to us that you are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. What did Jesus do? He simply did not accommodate them. And he will not accommodate us as well, my brothers and sisters. You know, the same, same uh, you know, in, incident which is mentioned in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 8, is also recorded in Matthew's Gospel. You know, in Matthew's Gospel, my brothers and sisters, it is mentioned in Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. You know, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 to 4, we see there that in unlike in Mark's gospel, even the Sadducees came along with the Pharisees. This is the same incident that took place. Let's read verse number 1. So I want to show you something. Who were the people who came asking him this question? Who were the people who came tempting him with a sign from heaven? Let's read that. Verse number 1. The Pharisees and also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now, you know, as I said to you, and we have been learning about the Pharisees, you know, the Pharisees were hypocrites. They never came to Jesus in order to learn anything from him. They only came to find some fault. They only came to, you know, check whether anything that Jesus said was against their doctrine, against what they have been hearing all this time. Some of the things that they had put had become like, you know, concrete jungles in their brains. And therefore, even they were hearing Jesus speak, it was something that was contrary to what they were thinking. It was contrary to their theology. And therefore, they would start attacking Jesus. And therefore, brothers and sisters, the Pharisees, you know, had sort of, you know, what would I call them? They had made a mountain of, you know, of all these rules that they had come. But yet, they were simply sticking according to the written law. But the written law was simply added. They had, you know, modified it. They had interpreted it differently. They had introduced from 10 commandments and made something like 500 commandments. They had brought in some rules and regulations. And then they had made a rule book and they were forcing people to obey the rule book. The Sadducees, on the other hand, you know, did not agree on the resurrection. You know, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, but they had a common enemy in Jesus. So the Sadducees and the Pharisees now united together against their one common enemy and that was Jesus because they wanted to get rid of him. And you know, my brothers and sisters, we all know how the Sadducees and how the Pharisees got together and they actually got Jesus arrested and they put him under a mock trial, a false trial, and they allowed Jesus to go to the cross. Jesus surrendered himself and Jesus died an innocent death of course, it was the will of God that he should, have, he should die for the whole human race. He knew that when he came to the earth, the devil would be after him. But little did the devil know that by touching the son of God, he would lose his authority over the earth. He would lose his authority over man. He would lose his dominion, which he had obtained from Adam. So, brothers and sisters, what we are learning in, the, in this verse is, let's go back to Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, let's go to Mark chapter 8, verses, uh, verses 11. Mark chapter 8, verse number 11. Praise God. We'll, we'll come back to Mark chapter 8, verse number 11. So in verse number 11, Jesus was simply telling, talking about, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came to Jesus with only one intention. And what was that intention? They came with the intention in order to tempt Jesus in order to make Jesus, you know, uh, find something wrong with him, something, some fault with him and put him into a very embarrassing situation. But you know, my sister and brother, Jesus would not fall for their trap. He knew that these people had not come to, you know, believe in him. He knew that they were not come there because they were sincere about learning anything. He knew that those people had come only with one intention in order to tempt him to find something wrong with him and therefore he did not succumb to their to their demands of you know uh, you know to their demands of unbelief he did not entertain them and he will never entertain us as well we should never ask him for any signs let's go to verse number 12 and he sighed deeply in his spirit and said why does this generation seek after a sign Verily I say unto you, 
there shall no sign be given unto this generation now if you look at this verse very carefully the moment jesus hears this question or this request from the pharisees from the sadducees from these religious leaders what is the response of jesus you see he sighed deeply in his spirit you know my brothers what is the meaning of somebody sighing deeply in their spirits it shows you know it shows anguish it shows you know uh, it shows a bit of frustration it shows you know how disappointed he is because these are the people who are supposed to lead the people these are the people who are supposed to be the leaders of the church these are the people who are supposed to encourage the people and they have come to jesus in order to ask for a sign they have come to jesus in order to ask him for some extraordinary sign you know my sister and brothers think about it today just think about it today we are living in the 21st century we are living in 2022 this is the church of christ today in 2022 there are people in the church who are supposed to lead people to the lord they are supposed to lead people to christ and because they are not doing their job because they are not being the shepherds do you know what the lord is doing he is simply taking the shepherds aside he is raising new shepherds and he is asking the shepherds to go out and feed the truth to the people of god you know my sister but i don't want to go there because it's a teaching by itself if you go to the book of ezekiel it talks about you know god is going to do away with those shepherds and he is going to raise up new shepherds so that those shepherds will go and teach and preach the truth of god's word to the people who are right now simply doing religion simply doing rules and regulation who have been burdened with theology who have been burdened with so many things which are not according to the word of god and as a result in in order to save those people in order for those people from being lost for all eternity is raising up new shepherds so that they can go and perform those miracles for the people only when they believe the good news of jesus you know sister and brothers when these pharisees and these sadducees they came to jesus asking for a you know for a for an extraordinary sign in this verse we see jesus telling them that their request or i would say rather their demand was a very hypocritical demand they were hypocrites why they were hypocrites you know they could discern if you see these people they could discern the smallest signs of the weather you know jesus had also told them you know when you see the sun turn i mean the the sky turn uh, reddish you know that you know that the sun is going to be out you know when the weather changes uh, you know it's becoming cold you know that the winter is going to come when you know there is a south westerly wind you know that the weather is going to change you know on the physical signs all these things happening and he says these people who are the religious leaders they could discern the smallest signs of the weather but the great miracles you know which he had performed were not enough for them you know jesus had raised people from the dead he had performed miracles of feeding 4000 people people were talking all over the place of all the miracles that he was doing and yet after knowing and hearing and seeing all these miracles that was not enough for them you know my brothers and sisters these religious leaders they didn't require some you know some spectacular signs to discern the weather they did not need some spectacular sign they did not need god's voice to say oh the weather is going to change oh there's going to be some report oh they just knew by looking at it that the weather was going to change not because they were not they were not full of unbelief for these things they knew that the weather was there they could see it with their eyes they could know that the weather is going to change they had but you know my sister and brother these particular religious leaders they had hardened their hearts towards jesus they had hardened their hearts you know you know think about it my sister and brother today there are many people who come to go to a retreat they hear the truth of god's word and then at the end of it even though they get convicted they will stop coming to that retreat they will start talking against the preacher they will start talking about the teacher they will start talking about the man of god because what they have heard that day which has convicted them has made them now instead of changing start pointing finger at the teacher and at the at the preacher you know sister and brother these are exactly what hypocrites will do instead of changing according to the word of god 
they will start pointing fingers to the teacher they will start pointing fingers to the preacher they will start pointing fingers to the man of god and these religious leaders these pharisees these scribes these sadducees they had already hardened their hearts towards jesus and they wouldn't be satisfied irrespective even if he raised the man from the dead right in front of them you know you know my brothers and sisters think about it today if somebody you know he goes to a retreat and they bring in a person who's just dead and at that retreat somebody is raised from the dead you know what they are going to do people who don't want to believe they will say oh that person was not brain dead possibly there was little bit of heartbeat there maybe this is all staged you know it's all it's an orchestrated it's all you know that the man was never dead but just for the preacher to get some big glory they brought this dead man so they will have re different reasons that even if a dead man is raised to life they will never want to believe Ir irrespective whether they see somebody even if they see somebody you know who's who's having a very big sickness or you know having arthritis or somebody with deaf ears they will think you know what oh that's all fake that's probably you know these people are just brought there to you know promote something but they will never want to believe you know sister and brother regardless of whatever jesus was going to do these people had hardened themselves to jesus they were not interested to hear the word of god they were not interested to change they were not interested you know to 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 change their thinking in line with the word they were interested to find fault with jesus they were interested to to discredit jesus they were interested to destroy jesus's ministry which they eventually did because they were not interested to change within and you know my brothers and sisters this is a great danger for us you know when you and i believe the word of god don't you ever go to somebody who's going to sit and argue about the word of god he's not going to tell you you know rule number so and so says this 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 says and you are telling me something according to the word of god no 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 that's not the word is not true the rule book says so and if you are going to go into an argument with such people i tell you my brothers and sisters it is better for you to simply walk out from there it is better for you not into get into argument with such people you simply walk out from there because this attitude is an attitude of a pharisee this attitude is somebody of somebody who is want to simply debate he wants to argue he wants to prove that he's right because he's got a rule book but he will never ever refer to the word of god because there is no spirit of god remember my brothers and sisters the word of god is not to be argued the word of god is not to be debated the word of god is not to be discussed the word of god is simply to be believed the word of god is simply to be believed if you believe the word of god if you understand what the word says and do what the word says you will surely see the glory you will not argue you will not debate you will not try to bring some rule book and you try to bring some history and some geography and some philosophy and theology and prove the word of god wrong anyone who does that is simply going to be taken out from his job and the lord is going to raise shepherds who will preach who will teach and preach to the people the truth of the word of god i hope my brothers and sisters you are understanding this today in the body of christ the lord is doing precisely that he is raising up shepherds who will go and preach the unadulterated truth of the word of god and if you can understand this you are on absolutely safe ground you are absolutely on a holy ground you are absolutely on the right foundation but if you are going to oscillate between religion and the truth you will never ever come out of this of this conundrum and you will find yourself simply living a life on the you know like like a pendulum day in and day out and you will never see the glory any single day of your life you know sister brother just just to, just to you know emphasize on this you know these religious hypocrites could understand the weather they could understand the weather but could not understand you know spiritual truths they couldn't understand spiritual truths and 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 you know the, the spiritual climate in israel was quickly changing as jesus was teaching and preaching the truth among them think about it no other prophet ever had come to israel and ever taught the word of god with such signs and wonders with such great miracles 
what he was saying, he had never proved it. But here was Jesus, the son of God, as he was preaching and teaching the word of God, the climate of Israel, the spiritual climate in Israel was changing. But these religious leaders were simply stuck to their rules and regulation. These religious leaders were simply stuck to their theology. These religious leaders were simply insecure about what they were doing because now people were leaving them because everybody was going to the truth of God, but they were following Jesus. And now they began to start persecuting even the son of God. If you, my brothers and sisters, are really believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe the word, be ready for persecution. Welcome to the club of persecution. Because when you operate and believe the word of God, you are simply going to depart from religion. You are simply going to depart from the rule book. You are simply going to depart from theology, which is not according to the truth of God's word. And you will be thrown out. You will be uh, excommunicated. You will be considered a rebel. You'll be considered a reject because Jesus has said this to us that once you come to him, you will be persecuted. You will be thrown out of the synagogue. You will be brought before the religious leaders. But at that time, you will not have to defend yourself. But the spirit of your father in heaven, who is on the inside of you, will give you the wisdom, will give you the words that even your enemies will not be able to refute. They will never be able to argue because the truth will be given to them. And that's the time the truth will possibly, may possibly set them free. You know, my sisters and brothers, please remember this. Jesus was not going to give them a sign. He was not going to show them his glory just because they asked him. The only way for you and me to see the glory today is by believing the word of God. Not by, you know, praying too much, not by doing theology, not by trying to do philosophy, not trying to impress God with our own religious life, but simply by believing the word. The moment I believe it, I understand it. I do what the word says without argument. And the moment I do it, I surely see the glory every single day of my life. Amen. Let's go to our final verse. Today is a short gospel, but I believe that there is something for us even in every word that we hear today. And he left them and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now, you know, when you just read this verse, I just thought I'll just read this and say, okay, if Jesus finished there with them, he left the boat and he went across to the other side. But you know, sister and brother, as I told you, in order to get the complete picture, you need to go to the other synoptic gospel writers. So let's go before Jesus finished verse number 13. Let us see what he said in Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 16, verse number, verse number four, I believe. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16, verse number four. Remember from verses one to four is exactly what happened in Mark chapter eight, verses 11 to 13. But Jesus did add something else in verse number four. Let's read that. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Look at what Jesus says in verse number four in Matthew's gospel. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Brothers and sisters, I hope you're getting this very right. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. That means if we are asking the Lord for a sign today, this word applies to us as well. A wicked an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. You know, my sister and brothers, listen to this very carefully. You know, wicked people, wicked people are always seeking signs. Wicked people are always seeking signs. Whereas godly people just read the sign God has given to them. Please write it down and remember this so that we don't fall into this category of adulterous and, and you know, a wicked generation. Remember, wicked people, they are always seeking a sign. But people who are godly, people who know the word of God, just read the sign, just read the word that God has given to them and they follow it. They don't ask questions. They don't debate on it. They simply do what the word says. And therefore, if you are one of those today, 
who simply looks at the written word, understands what the word says, and simply gets into action. I tell you, my brothers and sisters, you will see the glory every single moment, not even a day, every single moment of your life. If you are not living a supernatural life, we are living a superficial life. Remember, you don't need to ask the Lord for signs and wonders. Otherwise, you come into a category of wicked and an adulterous generation because wicked people will always want to have a sign. They'll tell the Lord, Lord, if you do this, 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 if you do this, 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 that, then I will go and give my life to the Lord. You know, my brothers and sisters, by the time the Lord gives you all that, you have another demand and you will simply keep giving. God does not give you based on, you know, you putting conditions to him. You believe the word and you will see the glory. Don't ask the Lord for a sign to tell him that he's God Almighty. God has got a class of his own. You can't tell God Almighty to give you a sign so that you can believe in him. God is saying to you, you believe my word, then you will see the glory. Then you will see the signs and wonders. But these people, my brothers and sisters, and anyone today who basically asks for a sign, is simply wicked and adulterous. And therefore, if we have done that, we need to repent. We need to ask the Lord for his repentance. And we need to simply change our thinking, get to the word of God and start believing the word of God. You know, sisters and brothers, coming back to what he says in, you know, in Mark chapter uh, 8, verse 13, he says, he left them and entering into the ship again. You know what he did? He departed to the other side. You know, my sister and brothers, look at what happens in verse number 13. He has <laughs> left the place where he has performed the miracle. He has gone across to the other side in, in Magdala or Dalmuta. And there those people, the religious leaders, have simply got into an argument with him. Do you think Jesus is going to waste his time trying to teach such people? Is he going to waste his time going to give them a teaching? Is he going to preach to them? Is he going to perform signs and wonders? Oh, he doesn't want to waste his time. He gets back into the boat and he returns to the place where he performed the miracle of feeding 4,000 people. You know, my brother says, Jesus immediately, he left that place without ministering to anybody and returned to the place where he had started from. And therefore, my brother says, what do we learn from here? What do we learn from here? We too should do the same. Just move out from that place where people are going to sit and argue People are going to just talk about nonsense and don't waste your time. Don't waste your energy arguing with people, arguing with the hypocrites and unbelievers, but simply move on to the next place. Dust the, the even, even, you know, uh, you know, just dust your feet, you know, of all the dust that is there, all the rejection that you have got there. Move on to the other place and give the people the gospel because there'll be many people who will receive the good news of Jesus. If you know them in a particular place or a particular city or a particular family or a particular group or a particular community who don't want to hear the word of God, just leave them alone. Don't waste your time. Just leave them alone. There are many people who will receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Jesus did. He left them and he went and began to go back to the place where he started from because there the people had seen the glory. They had seen Jesus feeding them with, four, with seven loaves and a few fish. And 4,000 people on the other side would surely have known that he's come back all the way and would have gathered to listen to him once again. Brothers and sisters, if you and I are today believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, let us also go and share the word of God. And if you find people who are not ready to listen, they are only going to argue. Don't you waste time arguing the word. Don't try to impress people, trying to convince people. It has to come by a revelation. You and I cannot bring into, cannot make, make people understand. It is only the job of the Holy Spirit. If they don't accept Christ, they don't surrender their lives to Jesus. You are going to waste your time. You will be discouraged to go up to the finishing line. You simply need to move on and do what the Lord has called you to do so that this word, the good news of Jesus, can reach to the ends of the earth. Amen? Let us pray. Sister Joyce, let us pray. Oh Lord, almighty God, every day you speak to us through the scriptures. Thank you, Lord. There's a message given to, each, to us each day, each time we go to them. Now the Son of God, 
has spoken to us um, through our to the anointing on our brother Vincent. And that word is amongst us, Lord. That word has become flesh. Let us treasure your word, Lord, and let us put it into practice. And dear Lord, let us not fall into that category where we ask for yet another sign of your love for us. Help us, Lord, to see your signs all around us in the love we receive from others in, in, the, in the nature and beautiful, in the scriptures and in the healings you give us through the Holy Spirit, the word, the word which assures us of your love and your presence in our lives and in the world at large. And thank you, Lord Jesus, as we declare that here right now, today, we are filled with your Holy Spirit. And we are moving with that fresh anointing on all gathered here and also on all our listeners. Lord, help us, help us, Lord, to step out in confidence without any excuse, Lord, to do your will as you have assigned for each and every one of us here on earth with your word, as aligned with your word, Lord, and in total submission. I make this prayer to our um, Almighty God, through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Praise God. Thank you, Sister Joyce. Praise God. Amen. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.